Okay, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out to our sixth annual Summer Statistics Institute's industry panel titled Statistics in Industry, Challenges and Opportunities of Data-Driven Decisions. My name is Lauren Myers. I'm the director of the Division of Statistics and Scientific Computation here at UT. Um, and the division is the organization at UT that's hosting the Summer Statistics Institute, which many of you, I believe, are participating in. And before we get started with our exciting panel of experts, I wanted just to tell you a little bit about the division and some exciting goings on with respect to statistics at UT. So the division is basically home to statistics, and um, one of our featured programs is the Summer Statistics Institute. In case you're not participating in it and just happen to walk into this room, I'll let you know that um, every uh, May we offer a wide selection of intensive short courses, usually around 20 different courses, ranging from introductory statistics to specialized topics in statistics and scientific computation and machine learning. And um, we bring in hundreds of students from inside UT and, and the broader Austin and industry community. In addition, during our school year in the summer here on campus, the division offers certificate programs and portfolio programs for undergraduates and graduates wanting to dive deeper in statistics and, and machine learning and, um, and scientific computation. We have a master's program in statistics. We are about to launch a brand new PhD program in statistics with our first students arriving this fall. Uh, we offer dozens of undergraduate and graduate courses from introductory to very advanced statistics, scientific computation, uh, machine learning. Throughout the year, we offer short courses on different topics, particularly on different um, statistical programming languages, statistical software courses. We have a very strong consulting group that um, supports research across the university, research by students, staff, uh, uh, faculty, um, helps them with statistics, experimental design. Um, for those of you uh, coming from the outside world, we have just begun a couple of great programs um, that are bringing us closer to industry, closer to corporations. We have a corporate partnership program that we just launched this year with our first corporate pa uh, partner, Freescale, in which we are bringing industry data and industry, industry problems to small groups of graduate students, and they go through semester-long supervised research projects, and out of it comes um, relevant results to the industry, great experience for our students, and also a pipeline for recruiting some great talent out of our student pool. Um, and we are also starting to offer specially ta tailored short courses on site for, for other organizations, for industry and, and, and organizations outside of UT. So um, if you want to know more, please don't hesitate to contact me or any of the other SSC staff that you see sometimes wearing t-shirts or not throughout the week. Um, Marilyn is modeling one for us over in the corner. Um, please come ask us about the division. And we are only about six, seven years old, and we are growing quickly, and, and our offerings are expanding every year. So, so please stay tuned and get in contact if you have any questions about the division. So I'm really pleased to have you all here today, and especially pleased to have our panel of experts sitting before you. These are people that are um, affiliated with visionary organizations. Uh, companies and, um, and public agencies that are really at the forefront of using data to advance knowledge, industry, health, uh, uh, human well-being, social networks, etc. So really using data for all sorts of purposes to advance our world. And it's, as you know, I think you wouldn't be here if you didn't know, it's a very exciting time for data and statistics in our world. It's just an explosive time. And one of our favorite quotes uh, came from um, the Google's chief economist in 2009, where he said, uh, statistics is the, the sexy profession of, of the century. So I think it is, and we're going to hear why it's so sexy from our, from our uh, panel of experts. Um, let me briefly just um, mention who they are, and then I'll let them give you a little bit more in-depth uh, introductions of themselves. So we have um, Richard Gorlick, who's CEO of RGM Advisors. Steve Gray, Head of Data Science, Warehousing Business Informatics uh, at Freescale Semiconductor. Uh, Elizabeth Jambor, Manager of Data Analytics and Business Intelligence at Austin Energy. 
Um, Neville, oh, we're going in a different order. Charles Thornburg, founder and CEO of Civitas Learning. And Neville Letzrich, Executive Vice President of Product Management at Bizarre Voice. So thank you very much for being here tonight. And um, to start us off, we have asked them to prepare a brief uh, self-introduction. And specifically, we've asked each one to prepare to answer three questions. What does your company do? What do you do in your company? And how do you define big data for yourself, for your company, and or for your industry? So Richard, would you please start us off? Oh, sure. Thank you very much, Lauren. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. So my firm is a quantitative trading firm. Um, and what that means is that we use our own money uh, to trade stocks, futures, currencies, commodities, various financial instruments around the world um, using a variety of different automated trading strategies. Uh, inherently, this is a very data intense process. I'll talk a little bit more about the data and what we do as we go forward. Um, but I just want to give an example of the type of thing we might do to help put it in context. So I think an example that's helpful is to think that you want to trade United Airlines stock. Um, if you want to trade United Airlines stock, you want to know what is it worth, and you want to make that decision based on data. In our case, we call, we'll call it big data. You know, there's a lot of things you could look at. You could look at what has happened, and, you know, and, and there's a lot of ways to figure out what United is worth. You could look at financial statements. You could talk to the management team. You could watch someone on CNBC. You could do all sorts of things. You know, they, they, that's typically, if you're going to make an investment as an individual investor, you're looking to make that investment over a long time horizon, over months or years. Um, what we're trying to do is we are in competition with lots of other firms to figure out what is the value of United Airlines at 9, 45, and 13 seconds. You know, what is that instantaneous fair value? And we can look at things like um, what's happened to United Airlines price over the, you know, recent periods of time. We can say what's happened to related stocks, um, other airline stocks, for example, over recent periods of time. We can look at commodities that may be very important to an airline stock like oil prices or interest rates. And we use all of those, we build predictive models, taking in a lot of data into account, and make a judgment as to what we think the fair value is at any particular moment in time. Um, so what I do at the firm, I'm the CEO, so that means I do a little bit of everything involved with the business. And then the question about how do we think of big data? So people have traded for hundreds of years <laughs> in very similar ways, but typically a human would have to either stand on a trading floor or behind a desk on a phone and do something. And they would have to do very similar things what, 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 that we're doing to figure out what something's worth. But a human is inherently limited in that they can only keep a few numbers in their head at the same time. They can only think of maybe a few other instruments that might be valuable to this calculation. And the types of calculations that they can do are relatively simple. Um, from the very beginning, our view of the problem was, well, if people can make money standing on trading floors, yelling at each other and drawing lines on stock charts, then surely applying some computers to the problem might be helpful. And so for me, thinking about big data, it's really in our business, it's any type of uh, data set that's so large or complicated that a human trader using uh, traditional tools wouldn't be able to uh, handle it on their own. So that turn it over to Steve. Okay. So I'm Steve Gray. I'm uh, part of the CIO staff as our, in our IT department. Um, and I manage our data warehousing, uh, data analytics, data science division um, for Freescale. So the, uh, what Freescale does is we make computer chips. Well, not computer chips, but integrated circuits. So uh, we have a fairly wide range of sensor products, pressure sensors, accelerometers. We have a fairly wide range of microcontrollers. Uh, and a lot of those two types of chips will go into automobiles. So if you turn on your car and it tells you that your tire pressure is a little bit low, or if you are skidding out of control and about to hit something, it tells your car to fire some airbags, those chips likely came from Freescale Semiconductor. Um, we also have a, a fairly sizable digital networking business, so the routers, uh, enterprise-wide networking like Cisco and, and those sorts of places, um, we make multi-core processing chips for that particular product set. Um, we make roughly 3 billion chips a year. And, and as I go into our big data uh, question, each one of those chips, we take roughly, let's call it 1,000 measurements, um, electrical measurements. We want to know what's the current, what's the speed, what's the um, capacitance in X, Y, or Z for a pressure sensor. Um, so that's 3 billion times 1,000 electrical measurements that we take every single year, it turns into about 15 terabytes a month of raw electrical data. 
And, and we need to use all of that to understand what's the distribution of our parts. Are we going to meet the customer specs? What percentage falls out of the distribution? And, and then from an analytics perspective, why? So what happened in the manufacturing line? What happened in the design? What happened in, in any pieces of, of that data stream that we have that can help us to have more of our chips work um, in the future? Because uh, people who don't ever work in semiconductors don't realize that um, of those 3 billion chips that we sold, we probably threw away another 400,000. Um, 500,000, and, and that's not particularly good. So we need to figure out how to get that better and get those distributions into line. Uh, I'm Liz Jambor. I work in data analytics and business intelligence, which sits in <coughs> distributed energy services of Austin Energy. And we like acronyms, so I'm DABI and DES for AE. Um, <coughs> uh, we're the city's electric company. We are approximately 100 years old, uh, a little bit older. We have uh, about 420,000 customers, which is primarily Austin and some of the surrounding areas. Our generation mix is um, gas, let's see, we have gas, coal, wind, biomass, solar, and some thermal energy. Um, and all of that data comes in different ways. Uh, the data that we deal with at Austin Energy is primarily meter data. So we've gone from a system where we took monthly reads of everyone to a system where now we can take one second reads. We don't because that's more data than we can handle at the moment, um, but we could if we wanted to. Um, in my group, my group is comprised of uh, market research, product development, measurement, evaluation, verification, contracts, and compliance. Um, and the way we deal with data comes in a lot of different fashions. The biggest, the two biggest pieces within evaluation, measurement, and verification is doing load forecasting so that we know um, of the energy that we're planning to save, balancing that against the energy we need to produce. Because heaven forbid, in July or August, we run out of energy. Um, we also come in back behind that load forecast and evaluate the energy efficiency programs that we offer residential commercial customers. So if we say that changing out your air conditioner is going to save you one kilowatt, then we need to come back and verify that that's actually happened. The other piece that goes with that um, more pure data is the qualitative data of our customer research. So we match the data of what customers are telling us, how they're perceiving us, how they like or don't like us with what they're actually saving. And we can apply that then to the marketing department and designing of other uh, new programs. Okay. Charles Thornburg, I'm a founder and CEO of Civitas Learning. Uh, we are a about a two year old, a little less than a two year old startup headquartered here in Austin. Um, and we're using, uh, we're working with colleges and universities to use predictive analytics to help improve graduation rates. Um, the way uh, the way we think about big data in that work, uh, I think, is in some ways not dissimilar from what Richard was describing. In that, uh, there are lots of decisions, big and small, being made by students, by faculty, by advisors, and by administrators all day, every day at institutions across the country um, that are often informed by theory, experience, uh, serendipity, anecdote, uh, and all of those decisions have an impact on a student's likelihood of graduating. So we use historical data and current data to build predictive models that identify each student's likelihood of successful completion of the course they're in, their likelihood of persisting to the next term, their likelihood ultimately of graduating on time. Uh, and we use the insights from those predictions to help inform decisions kind of big and small across the student life cycle. So big decision might be where you decide to go to school, what major you decide to take in any given term, what classes you take and what sequence or what combination. Smaller decisions might be uh, what you decide to spend your time on at any, uh, in any given evening of, of studying or what kinds of resources on campus you take advantage of from an intervention perspective or a tutoring perspective. Administrators are making decisions constantly about what sorts of supports they provide for students, uh, forecasting demand for different classes, how they align curriculum effectively with what employers want. Those are all decisions that there's an enormous amount of data available to help inform. There are currently no tool sets deployed within education to help inform those decisions and ultimately 
ultimately lead to uh, better student outcomes. So, uh, so that's what we do. Hi, I'm Neville Letzrich. I'm Executive Vice President of Products for Bizarre Voice, which is an Austin based company. Um, how many of you have ever bought something online? Okay. If you've ever read product ratings and reviews, you know, what other customers are saying about products, you probably use our software. So we're embedded in, um, in those websites for the largest retailers and manufacturers worldwide. So as customers are coming in and talking about products, as people are going in and reading what other consumers are saying, that's our software. And we're just embedding and we're serving. Every time you click on one of those pages, that's our software firing behind the scenes. So we roughly have, <clears throat> excuse me, about 500 million uniques uh, per month. We serve up about 15 billion impressions per month. So lots and lots of scale. On Black Monday alone, uh, we served a billion impressions last year. This year we estimated it'll be about 3 billion impressions. So that's a lot of information we're serving up. And it's, so it's one thing to go and capture the information and then we put structure on it. So it's not just what people think. We also put structure about where they're from, some stuff we're gathering from the consumer, some stuff we're inferring. Um, then we go through and we tag it, and we can show the manufacturers what people are thinking about their products. So the whole goal of this is to make sure that the right products are going the, on the shelves and the manufacturers can then respond to and, and make better products for the world. If you look at what, as, as we kind of think about big data, the company started in, in large part as embedded software on retail sites and then for global manufacturers. More and more of our product offerings are becoming about data because organizations want to respond very quickly to what consumers are saying um, so they can predict where customers are going to go, the kinds of things they're going to want next, and they're looking to their customers to help innovate. One of the best ways to do that is to grab the customer's voice. So that's what our software is around, and, and that's the kind of data we look at.